Brother William said, where are we going tonight? What scripture? And Miss Betty over there said, all over. <laughs> We're going all over the Bible. You better, have your, you better have your Bibles ready. It's something, you know, to have. Uh, it's something for me to say something, and then it's another thing for you to hear what I say, and then find out it's in the Word of God, as you'll follow along with me. You always have that right, and I tell people this, you have that right. If I say something, you should... And I'm not talking about demanding and breaking up the service here. But you can come to me at any time and say, Pastor, where did you get that? What chapter and what verse? And I'll be glad to take you. If you didn't get it in the service, I'll be glad to take you to the verse in the Scripture. You know, that's the problem. God has um, given us a mind to think. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't use it. Is we depend on everyone else to tell us what we need to think. And so if you will take the Bible and let God speak to your heart, the Bible is powerful. It's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It says that about, his, about itself in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 12. So if you'll take the Bible and let the Bible speak to your heart, apply the truths that you learn, that is the essence of living by faith. Just, to, just believe in God. Just believe in God. How much faith does God want me to have? Just enough to believe what He says. See, faith is not some mystic blackness that people say, we'll just step out in oblivion, step out not knowing where we're going. That's not what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You'll find that in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 1. So we step out on substance. The substance is the Bible. We step out on substance. We have an undergirder. We have a support. We have a foundation. That's the substance. We step out on God's Word. So that is living by faith. And that is what faith really is. All right, now in uh, Luke chapter number 5, we're going to listen to God as He speaks to us in Luke chapter number 5. It came to pass that as the people pressed upon Him to hear the Word of God, He stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now Gennesaret is uh, Lake Tiberias and also Galilee. So, so uh, it's called all three in the Bible. So it's the same place. And uh, the Bible goes on to say in verse number 2, And saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one ship, one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now this morning we pretty well focused on the great message taught from the Word of God. It's a wonderful message. The very Word of God was preaching the Word himself. Who's the Word of God? Jesus Christ. Can you, can you comprehend that? Can you comprehend, according to John chapter number 1, verse number 1, that the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us? And in verse 14, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's hard for me to comprehend. I believe it. Why? Because God said so. Jesus, many, many times, equated himself with the Father. He is equal to the Father. Now, um, we go on right here he, and, and we see how powerful the Word is and the precious message that was given. Uh, it's a wonderful message. Acts chapter number 13, verse 38 says this, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. The only, the only way man could have ever had his sins forgiven and eradicated cast as far as the east is from the west and buried in the depths of the sea is for a perfect sacrifice to appease God's holy demands. God's demands, the law, if you want to read God's demands, you can turn over to Exodus chapter 20 when you get home tonight and you can start reading God's demands of the law. All right, now the Bible gives us His demands and says there's no, there's no exception. The law does not say try, the law says do. So if you break one of the laws, which are 400 and some odd laws, distinct laws in the Old Testament, if you break one of the laws, James says that you're guilty of all of them if you just break one. I don't think anyone here tonight, I, I, I don't think so. If you think this, don't embarrass yourself. But I really don't think that anyone here will say, I have never sinned. I have never sinned. I've never missed the mark of God. I've always been perfect, right on target. Now, you see, that's why Jesus had to die, and that's the only sacrifice that God could accept. So God became a man. How did He do that? Born of a virgin. 
the Virgin Mary, the Holy Spirit of uh, God overshadowed Mary within Mary's womb, planted the seed of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus did not have a sin nature. And so he lived a sinless, perfect, holy life, never sinned one time, never thought of a sin. He went to Calvary and there God poured out his wrath on Christ for you, for you. And he was buried and he rose again the third day. Now that's salvation. That's what Christ did for you. That's redemption. He reconciled the world. He made peace with God through his blood that he shed. That's salvation. Now, if you want to get in on it, you need to believe it. You say, well, I'm not sure the Bible's true. Keep reading it anyway. Read it anyway. Listen to it anyway. The very Bible, you read other books, the Bible itself says of itself that it is the Word of God. It is direction. It is answers from God. Every trial, every situation, it is the Word of God. And the very Bible itself said that if you need the faith to believe it, you can get it by reading it. How do I know that? Romans 10, 17. So there it is on the wall back there. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. By the word of God. So I read the word of God and God, and, and I find out, I find out that over 1,500 years and some 60 uh, plus authors, they, they wrote this book without one contradiction and so there had to be one directing mind. All right, that got me started. One directing mind, no contradiction, and here it is. They're in perfect harmony. All of the writers are in perfect harmony with one another. It had to be God. Man could not produce a work like this. A fallen man, a bad man didn't write it because he wouldn't tell on himself. All through the Bible, man's telling on himself. David, Romans 3 and others. It wasn't a good man that wrote it because he wouldn't lie and said he did. So it had to be God. So here it is. Now, if it's God's word, I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to find out what he says. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to play around. I don't want to think I'm going to heaven. I want to know that I'm going to heaven. All right, now here we go. Uh, Jesus teaching the word. The very word is teaching the word. He taught the people out of the ship there in verse number three. He thrust out a little. Now, I said I was going to make an application this morning. We thrust out a little. We take little by little. We learn, we learn one truth at a time. One truth at a time. There is no way that if you're really not familiar with the Bible, no way anybody's going to dump the whole Bible on you in one setting. So what does that tell me? That tells me that you need to keep coming. You need to keep reading. You need to keep listening. You need to keep studying till you get it. Till you get the truth. Sometimes, sometimes I use maybe uh, analogies I shouldn't, but I think of a picture puzzle, a thousand-piece puzzle. Sometimes it's a little difficult to put a thousand-piece puzzle together. But when you get that last piece put in, what do you do? I see it. I, I see it. There it is. There's all of it. And so when we finally see these truths that the Bible brings out, and they all come together, we say, I see what Christ has done. I see that he's the only way to heaven. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto me but by, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, saith the Lord Jesus Christ there in John chapter 14, verse 6. So we know that's true. We know we come to Christ. And uh, of course, he made a way for us to get to God. He sure did. Now, when I said little by little, the, bath, uh, the uh, Bible talks about line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, back in Isaiah. But um, I want to I want to get over here to Romans chapter number one that I used this morning. Romans chapter number one, and the Bible says this in verse sixteen and seventeen: uh, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, verse seventeen is what I wanted to get at right here. For therein, for within the gospel, therein within the gospel is the righteousness of God revealed and it says from faith to faith so if we preach the gospel correctly it's going to reveal Jesus Christ because Romans chapter 10 verse 4 said Jesus is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth all right so I'm going to I'm going to find out about Christ it's going to uh, it's going to the gospel is going to the, the word of God is going to reveal Christ and the Bible says right here in verse number 17, from faith to faith. That means I'm going to get one truth at a time. 
one truth at a time. And you put all of those together and you see that there is no way that you could ever die and go to hell based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Already done, not to be done, but already has done. Amen? So you need to believe on Christ. All right, so we thrust out a little. We get a little bit of the Word of God. And uh, the Bible said in verse 4, Now when he had left speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. So, so we're going a little further now. Now we know the story. We know the tr a story is a true story. Uh, and, it's, uh, and of course the lessons are many. The applications are many. But the application here I want to bring out in verse number 5, And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. Now think about this. If Peter had not obeyed what he thought was an insignificant command, he could have never participated in a miracle. An insig it's seeming so insignificant because Peter uh, said, we've, we've did this all night, and, and, and Lord, I'm not going to be disrespectful to you, but we've done this all night. I'm a fisherman. I've been fishing now for, for 30 years, and uh, I've got this thing down pat. And so he didn't go, right? But he went. That's what I'm trying to say. It, because God said it. There is my substance. There's the drive to go. He said, nevertheless, at thy word. So he acted by faith, and what happened? He brought in, it broke, he broke the net, had a drought of fishes come in. All right, now we're on this matter of continuing a little by little by little, thrust out a little, truth revealed to those who seek. Truth revealed to those who seek. And this is where we're going to uh, walk just a little bit in the Bible. We're going to walk around a little bit in the Bible. In John chapter number 1, verse number 9. Tell me what that says. John chapter number 1, verse number 9. We've used it quite a bit. Jesus Christ, He lighteth every man that comes into the world. Every man. Not just some men, but every man. Jesus gives every man light. Now what we do is we act upon that light. We act upon that light and God gives us more light. Uh, Jeremiah chapter number 29, the verse that we quote a lot. Jeremiah chapter number 29, verse number 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. When you get serious with God, God is going to get serious with you. Amen. You get in the Word, you will find Him in the very pages of life right here in the Bible. So we're going to seek God. We're going to keep going as long as it takes. Look at Matthew 13, if you would. Matthew chapter number 13. I should have them little markers on my Bible, but I'm turning with you. Matthew 13. Matthew chapter number 13. Look at verse number 23. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and does what? Understandeth it. He that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bear fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Um, look back, if you will, uh, in uh, verse number 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, understandeth it not. I remember the first time that I was attempted to get serious with God. I picked up the Bible and I turned over to Matthew. I thought reading in the New Testament would be a good place to start. So I opened my Bible and turned to Matthew and it just seemed like a bunch of gibberish. I was reading the begots, the begots, the begots there in Matthew chapter number one. I attempted to read Matthew two, got a little bit of the wise man in there and some other things and I just put it down. I put it down. I said, I can't understand this book. I, I, I just can't. Well, I kept laying there in my bed. I was up in Central City, Kentucky uh, working on a job up there and was in a fifth wheel camper trailer and I just laid it up there at my headboard. Well, I waited a minute and then I picked it back up and then I remember saying, Lord, please, I really want to understand your word. I really want to get in your word and understand your word. I know I need it. I, I need your word. 
And I begin to read, and from that point it's been a learning process till today. I'm still learning. But I finally learned enough. I learned enough to believe Christ. You're not gonna, you're not gonna say you're saved on a whim. There's no one here that can say I was born saved, I was saved because my mother and daddy were saved, I'm saved because I went to church all of my life and I've kept this and I've kept that and I've done that. I was baptized, I was this. You cannot say that and you know you can't say that in good conscience and say you're going to heaven. You, you could, can you stand up believing something like that and say I know beyond a shadow of a doubt I'm going to heaven. People like that cannot say that. Why? Because they're still trying to please God. They're still trying to do something to please God when the Lord Jesus Christ pleased God for us, for us. Turn over to Romans chapter 10, if you would. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness... And going about to establish their own righteousness. Now let me, let me stop a minute. In chapter 10, when Paul, the apostle, picks up his pen and begins to write, who is he talking about when he said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for who? For Israel's they might be saved. For I bear them record. I am a Israelite. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. There's a lot of people in churches today that has a zeal of God and for God. For God. They, they want to do everything they can to please God. They want to be a good neighbor. They want to help people. They want to do everything good. Thinking that God is going to accept them on their goodness. I'm going to show you where he won't. We will not. But I, I'm going to show you here in, in, in Romans chapter number 10... They're ignorant. These people, these religious people are ignorant of God's righteousness going about to establish their own righteousness. What is establishing your own righteousness? Doing good, getting baptized, giving, tithing, going to church, good works. Now it's good to be good, don't get me wrong. Do I sound like I'm contradicting myself? All right, let me go on. See, these people are using that to gain audience with God. The Bible said, and they have not submitted themselves into the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Go over to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7. Brother Archer was bringing this out in Sunday school. These people right here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, 22, and 23 are standing at the great white throne and still trying to tell God how good they were. Still. Still. Trying to tell God how good they were. Look at uh, <clears throat> Matthew 7, verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. All right, I know what the will of God is. John chapter number 6 tells us what the will of God is. John chapter number 6, verse number 39 tells us it's to believe on him who is sent is the will of God. And if you want to look that up, you can. And then you look at, um, it goes on to say in verse 22, Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? What does that mean? What would I, if I said that today, what? Preached. Have I, I'm standing at the great white throne. My name's not in the book of life, ready to be cast in the lake of fire, and I'm saying, you've made a mistake. I have preached in your name, Jesus. And then look at this. And in thy name, I've cast out devils. That's what it says. Are you sure you know what you're doing here? I have preached in your name, I've cast out devils in your name, and in thy name done many wonderful works. You know what Jesus says to them? He says to those that are standing at the great white throne? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. 
He, Jesus Christ just called all of those good works works of iniquity. Why were they works of iniquity? They were establishing their own righteousness. They were, they were expecting God to let them in heaven because of all of the good things that they've done. When the Bible is clear, it's clear as a nose on your face. Caleb brought it out this morning. God had instructed Adam that it would be a blood sacrifice. Abel brought his sacrifice to God and God accepted it. Remember Cain and Abel? Cain brought the best he could do to Abel. I mean to Christ. Cain brought it to Christ and God would not accept it. Cain got very mad. He said, why won't you accept it? Jesus said, why are you wroth? Why are you mad? I've already told you what I require. I require a blood sacrifice. And so Abel brought the blood sacrifice, the lamb, the firstling of his flock, slaughter, brought it to Christ. And Abel brought the fruit of his hands there, what he could do, what he could grow, and how he could fix it. He brought it to Christ, and it was good fruit. It was wonderful fruit. It was good fruit. But Jesus said, why are you mad? I told you what I require. I require the blood. And you know what happened after that? Cain killed his brother Abel. You want blood, I'll give you blood. He killed his brother. Don't you know that day that Mother Eve said, how in the world could something that looks so good turn out so bad? When God says no, that's exactly what He means. He means no. Amen. All right, so... We see that these people trying to establish their own righteousness can't get to heaven. So let's thrust out a little bit more. Let's get more. What we're going to do is we're going to continue. And I'm going to spend the rest of the, the um, service time over here in John chapter 8. <clears throat> John chapter number 8. John chapter number 8. Now remember Proverbs chapter number 14 and also Proverbs chapter number 16, verse number 25. Both say the same thing. Proverbs 14, 12, 16, 25. So there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but then there are the ways of death. There's a way that seemeth right to a man. Well, it's logical. If I do good, God will let me in. My good will outweigh my bad, and He'll let me into heaven. That's the way we were raised. We did good. Mom and Dad rewarded us, and we did bad. We, we were disciplined. Yeah, so, you know, it's just... But moms and dads need to teach. Mom and Dad needs to teach the truth. I don't know what was said. I missed it. Oh, Santa Claus. That's why I missed it. Yeah, mom and dad teach Santa Claus. You know, you're good, you're going to get. Yeah. Good little boys, you're going to get this. And good little girls, you're going to get that. If you're not, you've been naughty. Yeah, well, okay, all right. That's the way we were raised. That's just the way we were raised, you know. I mean, the biggest part of the world was raised that way, the United States anyway. And so we expect we do good, we'll go to heaven. But the Bible says that's not, that's not what's going to get you to heaven. No, it's the blood of Christ. So we need to we need to keep on keep on reading and searching till we find out exactly who he is and what he's done for us. <clears throat> All right, now in John chapter number eight, are you there? John chapter number eight. I'm gonna go quickly right here in verse number verse number twelve through verse number twenty, Jesus Christ claimed to be the light of the world. John chapter 8, verse 12 through verse 20, Jesus Christ claimed to be the light of the world. Verse 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall, but shall have the light of life. So he claimed to be the light of the world. In verse number 21, 22, and 23, Jesus claimed to have a heavenly origin. He said, I'm the light. You accept me, you won't walk in darkness. He he claimed to be God. He claimed to have a heavenly origin. If you'll notice in verse 21. Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way and you shall seek me and you shall die and shall die in your sins. Uh, whether I go, you cannot come. Then said the Jews, will he kill himself because he saith, whether I go, you cannot come. And he said unto them, ye are from beneath. I am from above. Ye are of this world. I am of not of this world. Pretty clear if you ask me. He had heavenly origin. 
Every time, if you'll read the book of John, when the Lord Jesus Christ speaks, he brings out at least three points. I've said it over. Write it down. You'll find it if you, if you look for it. Heaven's my home. Heavenly origin. God's my father. And I can give you eternal life. That's what he said. That's what he was telling. I, I, I can give you eternal life. And um, everyone, and they, anyway, they crucified him. All right, so he claimed to have a heavenly origin. He claimed to be the I am of his people. He claimed to be the I am of his people. There is no mistaken, in, in, for the Jews anyway, there's no mistaken the great title I am. In Exodus chapter number three, when Moses said, who, sa who shall I say that sent me to Pharaoh? And, and God told him, tell, tell them, I am sent you. I am sent you. All right, so he claimed to be the I am of his people. Verse 24, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, who art thou? And Jesus saith unto them, even the same that I said unto you from the beginning. I've already told you who I am. He said, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true, and I speak, uh, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them of the Father. Then said Jesus unto them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you shall know that I am he. And that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. And he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. Only God could say that. No one else. It would be blasphemous for a mere mortal to say, I do always the things that please God. Jesus Christ he and the Father are one. Amen. If you'll notice in verse 58 of this same chapter, Jesus saith unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, what? I am. I am. Jesus said, I am. So we see he claimed to be the I am of his people, and then he claimed to be the truth which makes men free. Not sets them free, as we so commonly misquote the Bible, we say Jesus will set you free. Well, the Bible said Jesus will make you free. In verse number 30 through 36. Now, as he spake these words that we just mentioned, as he spake these words, many believed on him. Now, follow along real close here. Many believed on him. Then, Je then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? <clears throat> Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. Now, they believed in verse number 30. You cannot, you cannot deny they believed something about the Lord Jesus Christ. But not to any, and, and I say this, think about it, not to any personal trust or surrender. The Bible said they believed the words, because of the words that Jesus said, some believed. And then the Spirit of God, with the same pen that John's using, writes right here, he said, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. Some believed on him, so Jesus started addressing those that said that they believed on him. Well, if you'll notice, I'm going to go real quick right here. Um... Verse number 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said unto him, We not be born of fornication. We have one father, even God. 
Verse 44, Jesus said, Your father, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. <clears throat> so it seems that they really didn't get a hold of the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a superficial belief. A superficial belief. All right, now, in addressing Israel that believes in the one true God, in Jehovah God, and that's who Jesus Christ is, the one true God. But they believe the one true God, and then to say that they can be free, well, that's the word that they jumped on. That's the word they jumped on right there in verse number 32. The truth shall make you free. And then they said, we be Abraham's seed. We're never in bondage to any man. They are the physical lineage of Abraham, and there is no way that they could ever go to hell being the physical lineage of Abraham. So they thought. So they thought, brother. So they thought. So that superficial belief was kicking in right there, wasn't it? Now, they were depending, and verse number 33 tells us that's what they were depending on for their salvation, being born a Jew, their physical relationship to Abraham secured their place as a little s, S-O-N, a son in the family of Abraham. But it didn't. Verse 34 and 35, the son has more privileges than a servant. A son has more privileges than a servant. You are not sons, is what he's saying. The son abideth forever. You are not Abraham's children. If you were Abraham's children, you would love me. You would accept me. You would have accepted me as I came, Christ said. Because I am from God, and before Abraham was, I am. Jesus claimed for himself a sinless character after that in verse number 37. Look at it. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Abraham, believe me. Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. These people did not believe the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said in verse 41, You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus saith unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he that sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech, even because ye cannot Hear my word. You're blinded lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto you. He's preaching, but they don't hear. Isaiah said they would do it. Paul preached, but they wouldn't hear. They had a preconceived notion. Now, when I say cast out a little, we accept one truth at a time. Now we're learning some things. And the hardest thing that you're going to have to accept is just maybe... Just maybe you have it wrong. Just maybe. You say, preacher, you think you're the only one right? Oh, no, 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 I don't. But I, I think he's the only one right. Amen. Yes, I, I, he is. He's the only one right. And there was a time in my life that I had to swallow a whole lot of stuff I'd been taught as a child. I had to get rid of it. Why? Because Christ said, I am God. He claimed himself a sinless character all the way down through verse number 50. And there's no one here among us can make that claim. So he's worthy to be that sacrifice. Jesus claimed power to bestow spiritual life in verse 51 through 55. I can give you eternal life. That was his sermon. Three points right there. And then he claimed an eternal existence. Eternal ex existence. Jesus did not come in Bethlehem's manger. That's, that's not the first place he showed up. He was way back in creation, Colossians 1, 14, 15, and 16. He created this, this earth and the stars and the moon and the sun. Jesus is a creator. Jesus, I and my Father are one. And uh, I know him and keep his saying. And the Bible said this in verse 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it 
and was glad. You mean Abraham saw Messiah was going to take care of the sins of the world? That's what the Bible says. Galatians 3, 8, the gospel was preached unto Abraham. And then the Bible said in verse 57, Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and thou hast seen Abraham. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. You know what happened after that? They took up stones to cast at him. They, were, they was going to kill him. Kill him over the truth's sake. But it wasn't his time. But when it came his time, he willingly, willingly laid down his life for my sin and for your sin. And he let them spit on him. Pilate said, don't you know what kind of power I have over you? Jesus said to Pilate, you couldn't have any power over me unless God gave it to you. You know, do your worst. They crucified, they scourged him, they beat him, crucified him, and spit on him, mocked him, put a crown of thorns on his head, hoisted him up between heaven and earth. And he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. And that's what happened. He died there for our sins, placed in a tomb, rose again three days later, three days and three nights later. He's at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for the saints. And he is, the invitation goes out every day. Every time you hear the word, the invitation goes out. The Holy Spirit is pricking your heart, telling you you need to be saved. Consider this truth. Consider it. Come now, let us reason together. Meditate on it. Go over it in your mind over and over and over. You need to be saved. Amen? All right, I'm through. I'm through. We'll talk some more about that. I'm not through with John 8 yet, but let's stand to our feet.